Yeah. I'm going to let you take over the meeting and I'll, uh, I'll start when you call on me. Okay, great. So um, I'm so happy everyone is here today. So um, right now I see Nolan and Autumn and Lakin and Monica and Hannah and Millie and Lauren and Lindsay. Um, so uh, thank you guys so much for being here for Larry Gent. Uh, he is a wonderful Cherokee uh, sort of educator, storyteller. Um, he is an uh, Appalachian uh, sort of scholar. Um, he studied under Albert Hash, right? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. He was a famous Appalachian luthier. So he also plays the traditional uh, mountain music, string music that is celebrated at Merle Fest. Um, so this, I, Larry came and spoke to one of my classes in the past, and I was just so blown away by this connection between Appalachian and Cherokee culture and his knowledge about that and celebration of it. He's also a Methodist minister, is that right? So I think that that confluence of those three traditions is such a fascinating thing. Um, so uh, just to give Larry a little bit of um, background so they have read the Cherokee creation myth and they've also read the first fire story mm -hmm. um, and they've read some background uh, with uh, you know Cherokee history and they've read some other creation stories which I don't expect you to necessarily speak to but they read the Iroquois creation story the Navajo creation story and um, a Winnebago trickster tale <laughs> which was very naughty and funny mm -hmm. um, so, but I think anything you want to bring to this, any uh, discussion that you want to have will be great. And then I'll just kind of let you handle it the way you want to, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And thank you so, so much for being here. You, um, you know, I'm honored to be here and any can, anytime I can hang out with you, it's a good day. <laughs> well, I'm anytime honored. I met at a postgraduate seminar and uh, we instantly became old friends. Yeah. Uh, so I, I treasure her friendship and I hope you all are treasuring your time with her as well. Mm. I treasure my time with them. We have some really wonderful people in the class, students I've had more than one time, so I'm honored they're taking wow. time. Wow, they came back. Yeah. I never had that happen. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I've learned so much, you know, uh, about uh, Native American culture and stories and the significance of storytelling. Um, from since I met Larry, he, he really kind of helped open me up to learning more about that. So thank you. Thank you, Annie. Uh, so to bring you greetings from my people, uh, which is the Cherokee way of saying, hey, how you doing? Uh, and and you and you may have to take yourselves off mute to do this. You're supposed to answer in kind. Fine. How about you? Which is osta lihi na. Osta lihi na. Nihi na. Nihi na. Well, I, they're not off mute, but uh, I, I think they're speaking in tongues already. So it's a good. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, I, I taught uh, Native American culture at Virginia Western. I was a colleague of Annie's. Uh, taught for, uh, I think, 15 years. And like Annie, I'm a, a, a byproduct of budget cuts. And so here we are today. Uh, budget cuts worked out well for her and for you because uh, she wound up in the foothills of of the Appalachian Mountains, and, and that's God's country there. I uh, have lived in that area. I've, my roots go deep there. Um, I was a founding member of a group that I believe is still going, the High Country Storytellers, uh, mm. who are headquartered in a little place called Boone. Maybe you've heard of it. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I. I appreciate you all coming to bring me a little uh, reminder of home. Uh, uh, I want to start out by, by laying a little bit of storytelling background. I feel like uh, you can analyze and discuss stories and have a, a little bit more coherent uh, 
conversation about them. If you have a few hooks to hang the discussion on. So I'm going to try to share a screen with you right now. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, oh, don't need that. Um, oh, well. Um, so there are, uh, let me, let me see if, uh, can you all see that whole screen? Can you see like the, the colon after the word origination? I see Native American creation stories. Etiology is the study of causation or origination. You see the whole word origination there? Uh-huh. The study of the reasons behind the way that things are or the way they function. Okay. Yeah. This is one type of story that storytellers tell. And etiology answers the question of why. Uh, why are the mountains so tall? Uh, why does the, the fog roll in at the way it does? Why do the mists move around the mountains in the morning? Etiologies explain why things are the way they are and why they work the way they work. Um, so etiology is a, a $5 word for a, a, a genre of children's stories. Um, I have 10 grandchildren and we have a blended family of five allegedly grown children. <laughs> I don't know that you can prove that by observation, but by chronology, they're supposed to be grown. And with all those grandkids, Pappy gets asked why a lot. Uh, you know, toddlers go through that stage and uh, some toddlers never grow out of it. But why, but why, but why? Etiology, is the story genre that answers, but why? Um, so the, the next type of uh, story I wanna talk about are wonder stories. Um, wonder stories do deal with the numinous or the sense of awe. Um, wonder stories are not meant to explain why, they're meant to make you go, wow, so that's what's going on. Wow. They explain the will of divine beings, supernatural presence, mystery, or aesthetic power. I, I hope that at some point in your life, you've uh, viewed a beautiful work of art or read one of Andy's poems, and you went, wow. I believe that uh, all art is a type of metaphor and that metaphor creates reality, connects dots in a way that you never saw before. It's not that it describes a reality that was always there, it creates a new reality. And in a wonder story, it creates a reality that makes you go, whoa. Um, the, uh, the next type of story is, uh, familiar to anybody that has heard any kind of storytelling around the country store, uh, tall tales, um, are, are stories that, that, uh, tell unbelievable things in a believable way. And quite often tall tales are told in the first person as if this happened to me. Uh, I'm a fisherman, so there are lots and lots of fishing stories about the one that got away that are tall tales. You know, it was so big, the boat nearly sank. Um, often, uh, you recall stories of Paul Bunyan, stories of John Henry, the line between what's factual and what's exaggeration gets blurred. And this is true of an awful lot of Appalachian storytelling. 
uh, I often say that all Appalachian stories are true. Now that doesn't mean they're factual. It means there's a truth behind the story that's independent of facts. And in fact, a good storyteller will tell you that you should never let the, uh, the facts get in the way of the truth of the story. Uh, a lot of times the facts are negotiable, but the truth is not. Uh, so the biggest kind of story and part of what you're dealing with now is a myth. And uh, myth is translated from the Greek word muthos, and it does not mean a falsehood. That's the way Americans use the word myth. Oh, that's a, a myth that you get better gas mileage with the, the air conditioner on. Or it's a myth that you get better gas mileage with the windows rolled down. That's not what the word means. A myth is a story that tells a truth that's too deep for words. Um, if you want to know what one of Annie's poems means, you kill it when you start dissecting it. And the, my favorite example is, uh, my love is like a red, red rose. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that my love starts wilting in a day or two? Does it mean she starts to smell bad after a day or two? Does it mean that she's prickly and thorny? The more you dissect what does that mean, the farther you get away from the meaning. So it means what it says. And you have to go to the, the story to get the meaning. And the more you ask, what does that myth mean, the farther you get from the truth. Myths often define a people or a nation. And um, I think one of the unique things about uh, the creation myths in, in native culture is that often the community is created with the act of creation. So in a, the, the most familiar creation myth that we all know is the, the story of, of uh, uh, Genesis of, of Adam and Eve being created in the garden. Less well known is the fact that that's actually two stories told side by side, just sandwiched together for good measure. Uh, scholars call that the wet account and the dry account, and they stand independently on their own, but they've been sandwiched together for a reason. Um, in the beginning, the earth was created and the earth was created good. This uh, Genesis has in common with Native American creation stories, but the people Israel weren't created until like two books later. And in most native creation stories, um, that creation myth is what gives rise to the real people being created. Now, I wanna stress this point of the truth. Sometimes it's a kernel of truth, sometimes it's a grain of truth, Sometimes it's a whole pantheon of truth that is contained in all of these stories. And sometimes it takes a lot of listening for outsiders to get the truth behind it. But sometimes that grain of truth comes shouting its way through for those who take time to listen. Um, let me uh, pause to give you an example. This is from South America, but it's still from indigenous people of, of the Americas. I hope that uh, many of you will recognize these as the Moai, the statue, statues that overlook the sea on Easter Island. There are over a thousand of these statues on Easter Island, and they weigh an average of 14 tons each. Now, how did they get them from this quarry 
We know where they quarried them because there are some of them half cut out, still laying there. How did they get them from this quarry, all 14 tons of them, over to the, the seashore when uh, this island has largely been deforested? So even the idea of finding large logs to roll them on, we don't know how they could have possibly done that. Now, when the, the white people, you got to love white people, when, when the scholars showed up and asked the village elders, do you know how these got there? They said, the Moai are alive, they're living beings, and they walked there. And of course, the scholars said, <laughs> silly savages, Moai walked, the, of course they did. We'll figure out how it really happened. And so they, they tried dragging them out with, with all kinds of rope. They tried dragging them out with cranes. They tried bringing in uh, logs to roll them on, just in case there had been logs there when, uh, when they first moved them there. And then finally, finally, one scholar went to the village elders one more time and said, how did they get there? And they said, the Moai are alive. They walked there. And the scholar, unlike the other ones, went back and he looked at the base on the sculptures that were carved out almost ready to, to move. And they realized that the base on those statues was not exactly the same as the base on the statues that were in place. Something changed when they got them into place. And so they made a replica of a full-sized moai and they made ropes out of, the, uh, out of the fibers that grew there on the island. And, well, you watch what happened. it walked all the way to the cliff. Now, that's what happens if you start listening to the elders and you go, okay, before I reject that as stupid, uh, what, what's the kernel of truth here? Uh, and you can see what it, this, this is like, what you can't see is there's an equal number on the other side with that other rope. So this is like eight people moving a statue of this size. You can easily imagine how a hundred people could have moved that full-size statue. Now, what I find fascinating about this is even though this video you watch is, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years old, even though we've known this long that the Moai walked to the edge of the cliff, still to this day, if you YouTube the Easter Island Moai, you will get far more videos about the possibility that they were put in place by aliens than you will by the possibility that brown people could have been smart enough to figure out a way to let the Moai walk on their own. So I, th I think that 
sets the tone for how Native stories are often received by scholars to this day. Uh, I think it's, it's often easier for the scholars to believe that anything we're talking about happening was intervention by extraterrestrials than to believe that indigenous people might understand their own traditions better than we do. Uh, and so once again, I'd like to, to return to uh, these, these rubrics, if you will, of myth, tall tale, wonder story, and etiology. I wanna return to these as hooks to help you analyze what kind of story you're dealing with and what the point is. A myth tends to answer the question, who are we? Why are we here? A tall tale tends to answer the question, uh, what, what's the craziest thing you ever saw happen? A wonder story tends to answer the question, what is there in this world that's bigger than me? And an etiology tends to answer the question, why are things as they are? Now there are other types of stories we could analyze. Uh, legends tend to be a lot like tall tales, but often legends are about historical figures in the past and tall tales are often told in the first pres first person like the narrator was there not a hard and fast rule we could use other ways to dissect stories but let's start with these four as a way of analyzing the story and uh i want to go back to uh, the story of the first fire. Um, and uh, I wanna, wanna share with you uh, the transcript that you have came from a character named Mooney who was an amazing ethnologist. Uh, he was uh, uh, an academician, he was highly lettered, he was well respected. Uh, he wrote anthologies of Cherokee myths and a fantastic anthology of the ghost dance uh, with the, the Lakota people. Um, he was, in many ways, a white supremacist. Uh, he believed that uh, uh, the march of European civilization was going to obliterate all native people and all native beliefs. And that's why he was writing it down to save it because he felt like the march of civilization and science was going to sweep all this nonsense away. So as an ethnologist, he, he wanted to, to write it down to preserve it. Um, native people hated him at the time. But over the years, we've come to rely on him because he did such a good job of recording so many things. Still, in this story on fire that you read, there are some important storytellers' details that he missed. And um, I, I, wanna, I wanna start from the beginning with you. In the beginning, there was no fire and the world was cold until the thunders, the Anihan Chikwilaski who lived up in Galantilati, sent their lightning and put fire into the bottom of a hollow sycamore tree, which grew on an island. Now I want you to be watching those, those four characteristics, those four rubrics as we go. Uh, sent, their fire and put, put, sent their lightning and put fire into the bottom of a hollow sycamore tree, which grew on an island. Which category are we in right now? The animals knew it was there because they could see the smoke coming out at the top, but could not get to it on account of the water, but held a council to decide what to do. This was long ago. Every animal that could fly or swim was anxious to go after the fire. So the first element that's missing here 
is the fact that the earth was too cold for the two legged to dwell, and the the animals, all of the animals took pity on the two legged and they said, we must take care of our weaker brothers. Right away, what does that do to our relationship with the animals, with the relationship between hunter and hunted? When we look back and say, okay, in the beginning, we would have all died out except for the goodwill of the animals. But every animal that could go was anxious to go. The raven offered, and because he was so large and strong, they thought surely he could do the work. So he was sent first. Okay, look, y'all, I need you to unmute now because you're going to help me sell. You're going to help me tell the story. Um, this is going to be just like we're all around a campfire, and I'm telling this story to children. You need to know that. In Cherokee, the raven's name is Kaga. So what does the raven say to this day? Ka, ga, ka, ga. So I gotta have you all say that. You all gotta be the raven right now, okay? Go go kaga for me. Kaga. Kaga. See, this is all this is how this is how the story is told. The children enter into it, and this is how they, they learn the, the, and they would have been running around the campfire, imitating the raven, moving its wings and pecking its beak. You can do that too. <laughs> so so the, the story becomes part of a participation thing. The Kaga was saying, Kaga, I can go. And so the raven flies off. Now, you need to know that in those days, the raven was a beautiful shimmering blue, the most beautiful blue you have ever seen. And so when he flew high and far across the water, he alighted on the sycamore tree. But while he was still wondering what to do next, the flames leapt up and scorched all his feathers black. And he was frightened and came back black with fire. And the raven mm. is black to this day. But you can still see that this is so. For when the light strikes the raven, just right in the sunlight, you can still see that beautiful blue glowing beneath his black feathers. Now, wasn't it a crime to leave that part out? Uh, doesn't that take the, the story into a, a whole nother level as the children are listening? Uh, so you can help me out again. We're going to get to the screech owl now. Uh, screech owls aren't as common as they used to be. and even in Wilkes County, some of y'all, uh, so, some of y'all have lived in town all your life. You may have never heard a screech owl. Does anybody, anybody know what a screech owl sounds like? Help me here, y'all. This is audience participation time. I'm not even sure if I do. Okay. Yeah, I don't know either. Go ahead, Millie. I'm sorry. I, other people are unmuting, so I'm going to mute myself and let them talk. Go ahead. Go ahead. I have no clue either. I've never heard one. Okay. If, if you have heard one, you probably said to yourself, what the hell was that? <laughs> uh, they have a high-pitched, eerie sound, and I don't have a very good falsetto, so I can't do it justice, but it goes... <laughs> And so the screech owl's name is Once again, the children get to make the screech owl sound. After doing that, I gotta get a drink. 
So you, you all can, if you, and especially if you can do a better falsetto than me, you can do a screech owl now to help me out. There you go. Uh, uh, some other time I'll relate a story about how I came to be in, in a cypress uh, swamp in the bottoms of the Mississippi River and was going duck hunting and was going under a, a hawthorn tree carrying my bag of uh, decoys and a screech owl went off right in my ear. And I jumped straight up into all those thorns and I won't tell you what I said next, but it was not very pastoral. <laughs> uh, the next one we get to is the, the hoot owl. Uh, and uh, they teach you when you're calling hoot owls and you, you call hoot owls to make uh, turkeys call and give away their, their position. They teach you to say, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? But in Cherokee, it goes, and so the name of the hoot owl is Uguku. And again, all of the children get to help me and they all get to say, and they make hoot owl sounds. And the hoot owl's eyes are ringed to this day because the hoot owl and the screeched owl reached in, uh, looked in and the, the fire left rings around their eyes. Since you've read the story, I won't go on telling the whole story over and over, but of course we, we get to the water spider as the heroine of the story. And in the story, it identifies her as the one with red stripes. But when a storyteller tells this, in those days, the, the water spider didn't have any red markings. It wasn't until she wove that toasty bowl and carried the coal back over that the coal made those red marks on her back. And to this day, when we see water spider, we're reminded how that littlest of all creatures brought back the fire so that we could have life. Now, that, that's about as far as I want to go with that one, but I want you to help me dissect it. First of all, let's talk about the, the truth behind that story. Uh, I think the biggest truth is, in many ways, we human critters think we are the rulers of creation, and in fact, we are the weakest of creation. We need to be in relationship with our fellow creatures, and these days they call that ecology, and they think that Native people were the first ecologists. We're not really. We, our, our stories are not about the business of us saving the world. Our stories are about the world saving us. And uh, the idea that we are in charge is completely foreign to Native stories. Uh, secondly, that the weakest among us, the smallest among us, can have the greatest impact and the greatest gift. Uh, there are elements of etiology in the story. Uh, why is the black crow blue? Uh, I think there's some wonder elements to the story. Maybe you feel like there's some tall tale to it. And, and perhaps uh, you see some ways that this, this story of the fire helps define us as a people. So at this point, I wanna, wanna open it up and get your reflections. What do you see as the truths that that story teaches? I'm done talking, y'all. It's gonna be a long time. <laughs> 
I, I've unmuted myself. I just want to say that uh, I would love to hear from from you guys your responses, questions. Don't be self conscious. You know, uh, Larry is a very kind and um, generous uh, teacher, so don't worry about you don't know asking that. questions. Don't um, tell me that. that 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 sets the bar too high for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to say just a, as a reflection uh, before I turn it over to the students, I love your uh, statement that um, our stories about are, are not about us saving the world, but about the world saving us. That's so beautiful. And thank you. So I hope that some of you will uh, will talk to us. I'm going to mute myself and hope that uh, uh, we hear from some of the students. Um, I think one of the really interesting things from not only this story, but also the stories that we have read so far in class is the, I guess, relationship between like humans, animals, and nature itself. Because I like how rather than placing like one so high above the other, they're generally placed more or less on the same playing field, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's a really, you don't see a lot of that in, I guess, Western sort of stories. And I think that's a cool way of seeing things as, to be honest, as they are. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about that. Um, in, in European storytelling, most often the forest is an evil place. Think Hansel and Gretel, okay? Uh, and so in many cases, the Europeans came here thinking that the forest primeval was dark and foreboding and had to be conquered uh, in, order, in order for human life to happen. Uh, so thank you, Nolan. That's a, a good insight and uh, a good compare and contrast with uh, some of the, the Western approaches. Yeah, I love that. That's such a great connection. The depiction of the forest in um, in the fairy tales and stuff I grew up reading is very different from the depiction of nature that we encounter uh, in these Native American stories. That's wonderful. Thank you for bringing that up. And good question. Good comment, Nolan. Okay, I'm going to mute myself again. I hope we hear from somebody else. <laughs> Millie is unmuted. Do you have anything you'd like to chuck in here, Millie? Uh, yeah, so I was kind of thinking about uh, how the animals, when they went to get the fire, they got burnt. So I think it's a, uh, you know, a good comparison how if you, you know, you can be beautiful, but like if you do something wrong, like it can like burn you and like change your color in a way. Yeah, uh, there's a, a lasting effect there and, and that's part of the the etiology uh, uh, part of the story of uh, why are the black snakes black? Why are, why are the why is the crow sometimes look blue but most time black? Uh, but uh, yeah, this is uh, part of what you do with with uh, stories that you tell to children around the uh, around the fire. Uh, every child likes a story that's a little bit scary. Uh, so you can imagine after they've told this story, if the child is getting too near the fire, they say, do you want to wind up looking like Raven? <laughs> Get back away from the fire. Yeah. Autumn is with us. Go ahead, Autumn. Um, we read a thing about nature and how that humans are a part of nature and like all all my life I've really appreciated nature from where we live and like Appalachian and everything but I've never really seen myself as a as a part of nature and I think that goes back to what you said about the the fairy tales and kind of seeing the darkness and animals and stuff as kind of scary but we're part of it and it's what we make it so that's really nice to know. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, that, uh, that idea that we are in conflict, uh, 
I'll tell you when uh, uh, when when the first uh, settlers in Jamestown and uh, in uh, uh, Plymouth Rock started starving to death, it mystified the uh, native people because as far as they were concerned, uh, you know, nature was the great provider. So how can you starve to death when you're sitting inside the pantry? And they didn't realize that those folks had to be taught how to use the pantry. Uh, who's next? Um, let's see, uh, Hannah? Can you unmute and share your thoughts? Lindsay's unmuted. Go ahead, Lindsay. Um, I think that all the Native American creation stories are really interesting because there's really no division between nature, animals, and humans. They're all looked at as equal. And I find that really interesting because we don't really think of that in today's time. Thank you. Uh, that, that's something that uh, a lot of folks are trying to rediscover, isn't it? Yeah, and I also think like these stories, they make us have a new perspective and value nature more and like value the area that we come from, like the mountains and like the scenery. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll share with you, and, and I'm not sure uh, which creation story you read. Did you read the story? Did you read the story of the, uh, the great bird cooling the earth with his wings? Yeah. Okay, cool. So in, in a lot of translations that's translated as the, the great buzzard, um, in Cherokee, we call the buzzard the peace eagle because uh, he's the uh, eagle that never kills uh, to, uh, to take his food. Um, so it's, it's just as accurate to say that the, the creator called the great peace eagle to cool the earth um, and and that where his wings touched the earth that's where the Appalachian Mountains were created that's where the Blue Ridge was created and and you know that this is true because where you live you can look at those hills especially at sunrise and sunset and see the furrows along the sides of the ridges where the wingtips of God touched the earth. Unless the whole earth should become mountains, creator called the great bird home. But God made people for those mountains and made the mountains for people. And to this day, those who live in the mountains feel the touch of the wingtips of God. Uh, so again, the story you read was very accurate, but uh, it, it, it left out a couple of important points about what that means when the, the messenger of God touches the earth. So I, I hope that uh, that adds an air of wonder story to the Blue Ridge to you next time you you look up at the Appalachian Mountains in the morning or the evening and you see those wingtips of God along the side of the mountains. I hope you go, whoa. Nola? You're unmuted, Nolan. I thought you might be wanting to jump in. Oh, um, I, just, I just think it's, I think the, I guess ideology part of these stories is what fascinates me the most because it's like not only awe-inspiring like with like wonder story but there's a sort of I guess comfort in viewing the world in this way I think like I feel like it gives one so much more appreciation for the world around them than 
I guess we have now. Thank, thank you for that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's also a way of helping you remember the story. Because I'll tell you, I can't look at a crow glinting blue in the sunlight without going, oh yeah, I know why that is. <laughs> Uh, let's cast our eyes about the room. Uh, anybody else want to want to join in? Monica Meyer, can you unmute and share a thought? I also see Jessa. Jessa, Jessa, you're unmuted. Did you want to? Uh, I was just going to talk about. I like how in like all the stories, like certain characteristics of like certain animals or trees and stuff get like described like how they like almost earned these attributes by either doing something right or doing something wrong. And I just think that's really cool. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Uh, that also carries on to, to human, uh, uh, human critters as we listen to the stories is, uh, you know, there are consequences to what you, you choose to do and sometimes those consequences mark you. Annie, I'll let you take over and call on folks. Um, there's uh, someone in the chat, uh, Hannah, she can't talk right now, but she wanted to make a comment. Okay. I, I awesome. Didn't... Can she put it in the chat or something or? Yeah, it's already there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me see. Let me. I did put it in the chat, but I work at a daycare and my kids are asleep. And if I talk for too long, they're going to wake up. So I'm yeah, sorry. Sure. No, that's great. We. Can you see it, Larry, or do you want me to read it? Or uh, you go ahead and read it. Um, uh, because I'm share. Let me stop screen sharing. We've got the. Oh. Now I can see it. Okay. Okay, I've got six of them. Uh, yeah, she's down at the very bottom. I've been okay. commenting, but she Hannah writes. So I work at a daycare, and my kids are asleep in nap time, and they will wake up if I'm talking. I did want to make a comment on the balance that these stories bring to society as a whole. I love how the first myth we read in class, that was the Cherokee creation myth, uh, shows how a humble water beetle had such a big role in creating the earth as we know it. <laughs> Wonderful, Hannah. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Hannah. And there again, it's not the biggest or the strongest and definitely not the wisest, but the, oftentimes the smallest and most willing who are who make the biggest difference. Yeah, that's a wonderful observation. Um, one of the things that they read was this journal article by this Irish writer, <laughs> but it was about ecology and uh, Native American stories. And I thought I was going, I'm going to try to share a quote from it right here. Um, I love this observation that, uh, well, I can't, the, the the landscape in these stories takes on a deeper significance. It resonates the spiritual or mythic dimension. I thought that was a really, uh, like when I think about the Cherokee creation story and, you know, the significance of water and mountains and how even, uh, like you were pointing out, the, the language is a reflection of the natural landscape. Um, I, I thought that was a night of wonderful way of kind of stating that. Thank you. And uh, this is a bit of a rabbit trail, but a, a worthwhile one because of where you all are situated. Um, Native culture and uh, Celtic culture understood each other intuitively. Uh, they share a lot of the same kind of uh, thought patterns. They're both clannish people. They're both mm. warrior societies. They're, they're, they both know that being a warrior doesn't mean you're a badass, but that you care for those who cannot care for themselves and step into wow. the gap for them. Uh, they both understand that women are the greatest warriors. They both uh, understand time as an interconnected series of cycles 
not as a straight line as in Western thought. Mm. Um, and they both hate the Brits. So yeah. there you go. Uh, but uh, uh, in, uh, in that area where you lived, uh, there are three cultures that collided. Um, the uh, Anglo culture, the native culture, and the black culture. Mm. And um, one of them, I feel, you can guess why I feel that way. Mm -hmm. One of them, I feel, gets short shrift, like, uh, oh yeah, they were extinct. And then these other two cultures created Appalachian culture. But no, yeah. there, there was a third living stream here that influenced uh, uh, European culture at least as much as European culture influenced mm -hmm. us. Yeah, we um we read I, I forgive I've shared with them this ebook by this man named Keith Parker who was like a, a theology professor who wrote this book about the theological connections between Cherokee stories and the Jungian like as in Carl Jung the um you know psychology figure uh, but one of the points that he he quotes from Jung and Jung said that Americans have not they're not aware of how much Native American culture has seeped into the very like sort of essence of this country. Um, I thought that was such a fascinating uh, statement that, you know, it, it is a part of our being and our culture, even though it's not really acknowledged. Um, and that's in the Keith Parker book, guys, in the introduction, um, if you're interested in making sure you've read that. And then the other thing I wanted to say is I heard Robert Morgan uh, speak at App State. He, he's, uh, he's written a book about Daniel Boone and he's a novelist. He's an Appalachian writer. But he was saying that a lot of the um, sort of preaching traditions, I thought this was really fascinating, uh, the performative preaching traditions that we think of as associated with American Christianity uh, have their roots in Native American traditions. Yes, that like people saw Native Americans speak and they, um, they embraced that as a way of preaching. Have you ever heard that, Larry? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'd never, like, I, that's totally new for me. So anyway, we yeah. could pick Larry's brain forever, but yeah, sorry. Oh, no, no, not at all. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the Jungian thing, we could mine for two or three semesters, and yeah. we will not, but uh, I, I'll wrap up with... Uh, with the retelling of, of one more story, it's uh, where the bears came from. And, and this is another story that when they invite me to speak to a kindergarten or a preschool, this is one that I, I like to tell. It's, uh, it's about how uh, there was a little boy who got tired of having to go to the fields to work in the fields every day. And of course, the, the Cherokee were, were great farmers. We were we were not migratory. We, we mm -hmm. farmed the same fields year after year. And um, the three sisters were, were the staples, the corn, the bean, and the squash. And you plant the, the beans to nurture the corn, and the squash would keep down the weeds. But still, if you're gardening, you're going to have to work in the garden. And the little boy got tired of working in the garden. He kept running off into the woods instead of working in the garden. They kept having to go chase him down, scold him. You get back there and you work in the garden. And he said, I'm tired of working in the garden. And I'm tired of eating the same thing all the time. I'm tired of beans. And I'm tired of <laughs> corn. And I'm tired of corn and beans, and I'm tired of beans and corn, and I'm tired of succotash, which, if you don't know, is beans and corn. Um, and so they, they scolded him over and over, but he kept running off and finding beautiful berries and tasty nuts and other things to eat in the, the woods. And they noticed each time he went, he came back a little bit bigger and stronger and gruffer and hairier. We Cherokee are not very hairy people, you know. But he started growing hair. 
everywhere. And his parents sat him down and they said, son, we're worried about you. You're not working in the fields like you should. And he said, oh, mother and father, it's so much better in the woods. Come off with me and I'll show you. And they went off with him and sure enough, before long, their corn patch was overgrown because they were spending all their time in the woods. So the village had counsel with them and sat down and said, we can't have you running off into the woods like this. We need everybody working on the garden. And they said, no, we're going to work out in the, in the woods and we'll show you where the good things are to eat out in the woods. And in order to make it up to you that we're not home working as we should be, we'll, we'll give of our own flesh and blood, we'll give the hides off our, our bodies so that you can have warm robes and you can have flesh to eat. And this mm -hmm. is why the Cherokee consider the bears their brothers because that family ran off into the woods and became the bears. Mm. And so to this day, we give a prayer of forgiveness, ask a prayer of forgiveness when we take the life of a deer or any other animal. But when we take a bear, we say, thank you, brother. Wow. Now, that teaches children on a whole bunch of levels. Like, do you want to turn into a bear like they did? You better, you better get out there and work in the field. I think you're getting hairy around the ears. Let me look. You're getting hairy. And, and you, you teach the story by having the children stand up with you and make like they're hoeing around the classroom as, as we're tending the, the patch. And, uh, do you like corn and beans and beans and corn and succotash every day? And they all go, ew. Well, be careful. If you don't eat your beans and corn, you might turn into a bear. And, uh, and at the same time, it teaches kinship that you feel with uh, the bears that uh, both give us life and argue against us. Um, so that takes us to the top of the hour. I'm, I'm content to stick around a, a little longer as you kick that one around for a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, just thought I'd throw out another example mm. of how the community is created by the story and the story mm. is created by the community. That's really beautiful, Larry. Thank you so much for telling that story. <laughs> Um, and you know, it's so fascinating how there are the idea of man's relationship to bears and humans turning into bears, like that's a that's an archetype that you see in other contexts that fascinates me. It's you so, so much. <laughs> it, it, it's Jungian. That's what reminded me of the story. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. It may uh, so you you are okay, even though we're a little bit past one o'clock, Larry. Yeah. Okay, um, students, if you do need to leave, you're welcome. I know that you might have something else you have to do, but I just, uh, Larry, <laughs> I mean, really, that story was so interesting. If you guys are interested in using that story um, in your uh, work in the class, then we can definitely, I'll, I'll make sure you get a, a, a common copy that we can use because I think that's just wonderful. And I love how it has a, you know, it, it requires us to hold like contradictory ideas in our mind at the same time. Like, you know, uh, the beauty of being a bear, the beauty of being a human, the shortcomings of both, you know, like it's a really wonderful, like complexity there. And I, I think these stories require us to do that every time. Um, would anyone, does anyone have anything they want to say or ask? Well, before we go, as long as uh, we're talking about that confluence of cultures, yeah. if you've never seen it, I highly recommend the movie Rumble. Rumble, R-U-M-B-E-L-E? Yes. Okay. It's, it's about the, the Native Americans who rocked the world. Um, 
Did you know, for example, that the only, um, the only rock and roll song that was 100% instrumental that was banned for being seditious was by a Native American. Well, okay, what is that? I feel like I have seen that recently, but my brain isn't working. What, what's the song? It's The song is Rumble. Rumble, okay. I'm gonna have to find that. <laughs> and the, the movie is all about how Native culture shaped rock and roll. Wow, that sounds fascinating. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that suggestion. I will go, I will search for that. And how, how do you get a song with no words banned for sedition? Yeah. Well, how you do it is by being Indian because yeah. Indians are always just about to turn into bears. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating, Larry. Thank you so much. That's, um, uh, you know, when you think about how recently, uh, you know, how recently uh, there were like, you know, limitations on civil rights in regards to Native Americans. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, you know, that there were pretty severe restrictions that um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's something that we're very aware of as a culture. There are still no national statistics kept on how many Indians are murdered every year. Mm. There are no statistics kept on how many Indian women disappear every year. No. Mm. Yeah, I've read a little bit about that. Um, I uh, don't want to keep anyone too long. I just, like, I, I was taking notes as you were speaking and I just kind of wanted to kind of go over like some of my high points. Um, I loved how you said that all art is a metaphor that creates a new reality. Um, these stories are true. That doesn't mean they are factual. <laughs> Which, um, it makes me think of Picasso said, art is a lie that tells the truth. Uh, a truth too deep for words, you pointed that out. The community is created through these stories. Um, a lot of listening is needed for outsiders to get to the truth. And I think that's like our great challenge, as, you know, as uh, people who didn't grow up in this tradition, you know, is listening and really paying attention and letting the story resonate with us. Um, anyway, uh, the... Um, The buzzard as the peace eagle because and you had shared that with me earlier Larry and I didn't really get it but now I do now that I've heard you talk about it because he he's the peace eagle because he doesn't get his food he gets his food you know non-violently basically right mm -hmm. that's a yeah I've, I've thought a lot about why the buzzard figures so prominently in that story um, thank you so much does anyone have anything they want to share or ask Well, again, uh, I've, uh, I've recorded this and uh, I'll edit out our introductory comments and uh, get right to the meat of it. I'll, I'll put it up on YouTube and share the link with Annie so that anybody who wants to can review it. Thank you so much for doing that, Larry. Um, do so. thank, you. thank you for meeting with us. It was really nice. <laughs> well, thank you. It's a blessing to me to be able to share these things. Oh, I think we can all unmute and thank Larry. Mm -hmm. Clap for him, maybe. What do you this think, guys? This is how they clap in, in uh, American Sign Language. So. Oh, yeah. We're doing thank a lot you. of that on Zoom now. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> thank you so much, Larry. And thank you to all the students who came. I really appreciate it. And your presence uh, was needed and valued. And I made a note of who you are. So. Y'all enjoy the mountains and go trout fishing for me. Oh, well, <laughs> so good to see you, Larry. Thank you so much. <laughs> bye bye now. Bye. Bye. And I'll make sure I, if you're still here, I'll make sure I get you the link out that Larry 
where he recorded this. Thank you so much for recording that. That was one technological skill beyond me. <laughs>